My presentation is going to be uh, on the political elite in, in Iran. This is part of a um, book that will come out in uh, May this year, um, here on the left, Post-Revolutionary Iran, a Political Handbook. I will be sharing uh, a few of the insights from that book um, uh, here today, not the, not the whole thing, uh, because it's a 1,000-page um, uh, uh, manuscript. Um, let me explain why I became interested in this subject of political elite. Um, um, I have been studying Iran for you know, the last 30 some years, and I became quite dissatisfied with our state of knowledge about the Iranian elite in the sense that much of the discourse concentrated on a few key personalities, the supreme leader, the president, the chief nuclear negotiator, but we had no idea who really these people are who came to power in 1979. So I said, OK, I'm going to reinvent the wheel. I'm going to put together a database that will um, uh, have information, solid empirical information, about who these individuals are, so that we can, for the first time in the post-revolutionary era, start analyzing Iran based on hard empirical data and not necessarily journalistic accounts of, I went to Iran for two weeks, met with this person, and here is my impression. That, that, that doesn't do for you know, us in the scholarly uh, community. All right, so um, Iran's, anyone who has studied Iran knows that the political system is supremely complicated, as indicated by all these various arrows uh, uh, in, uh, on, on, this, on this chart that we have put together on uh, how the system works, okay? Um, what I decided to do was to basically um, figure out the information on the individuals who are in this uh, chart and, and figure out how significant they are in, 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 this, uh, you know, in deciding Iran's uh, politics. So let me start with this. Um, The project started when I came across an article by a former Iranian MP uh, who said Iran has been ruled by 200 individuals since 1979. And then some years later, um, a former um, hostage in Iran, John Limbert, said Iran has really been ruled by 25 individuals. Um, and President Bush, in his 2006 address, said this is a nation held hostage by a few clerical elite. So my first question was, who is right? What is the size of this you know, significant elite? Is it 25? Is it 200? How do we know? And the more I looked, nobody had the answer. So I decided, OK, we will do this. It took me 14 years to work on this project. I put together the biographical information on 2,323 individuals which to my knowledge, this is the largest database of political elite anywhere in the Middle East as of right now, not just Iran, anywhere in the Middle East. So some of the findings I want to share with you. Iran is a theocracy. And you would assume that most of the folks who are in positions of power are clerics. Well, our data indicates that clerics are really only 27%. They occupy 27% of the top positions. The rest are held by lay individuals. For example, most of the people who are serving in the Iranian parliament, of course, are not uh, 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 clerics. But you, know, you have the data here in terms of who is included in this database, right? Anybody in parliament, anybody in cabinet, anybody in assembly of experts, et cetera, et cetera, heads of the military establishment, um, guardian council, uh, assembly of experts, et cetera. So what we did was to uh, study positional elite, not necessarily reputational, right? So we were not interested in people's reputation, but whether they were holding important political positions. The book also has all sorts of other data, including data on 36 national elections, uh, data on 400 political parties, et cetera, but I don't have time to go to any of, uh, any of those here. So the questions that were guiding me in this study were things as, as, as this, right? Who are the members of the elite? Let me say this. Of the 2,323 individuals in my study, only two had served in the parliament in the pre-revolutionary period. Therefore, 
you can say almost 100% of these folks are brand new, right? And it begs the question, okay, what is their background? What is their ethnicity? What is the gender makeup of the elite? What are the staging grounds, right, that these individuals use to occupy higher positions of power? You know, what is their sh uh, share of Tehran among the elite as, as, as the capital? Okay, so let me start here uh, by the first parliament. One of the arguments that I'm going to make is that most of these elites, having looked at their background, we can say that they are predominantly the children of clergymen, farmers and small landowners, and bazaar tradesmen in particular. If you add up the first three numbers here, right, you will see that amounts to 66%. And if you add laborers, that's already 72% of members of parliament who come from those modest backgrounds. Of course, we have 22% here unknown. And if you add some of those as well, you can easily get to over 80% who come from this modest background. So when we say it was a revolution, bringing about a really different class of people, we are not kidding. Notice how the more modern, um, sorry, the more modern uh, positions, civil servants, professionals, etc., are in single digits compared to the other ones. Okay, moving on. I was curious to know what is the age composition of these individuals. And again, some interesting findings here. You know, in the earliest stage of the revolution with the um, interim administration of Prime Minister Bazargan, you can see that you had a median age of around 52 for, for these individuals, right? And then as 29-year-olds entered cabinet, you see this drop in the median age, right? And over here on the, on the extreme right column, you see the median age of these individuals in 1979. So for example, at that time, the cabinet was made up of, again, 52-year-olds, right? The administration of present president, Mr. Rouhani, at that time, they were a bunch of 20-year-olds, OK? So you can see this, this evolution, which of course makes sense because we are 39s past the, the revolution. When we go to the next slide, again, the same thing in terms of age composition for the Guardian Council on the left and for the members of the Assembly of Experts on the, on the right-hand side. Again, you see the gradual graying of the population, which is, again, quite understandable because in, in these type of institutions where incumbency level is very high, it's the same individuals who are simply just getting older, right? And therefore, their average age has gone up uh, naturally, as, as one would, would ex ex expect. Okay, one of the ways that you could really enhance your resume in a revolutionary state is whether you had served prison time before the revolution. So we were interested in seeing what percentage of these individuals had served prison terms. Okay, so take a look on the, uh, on the left. Okay, you will see in the earlier stage members of the assembly of um, experts, 43% of them had served prison terms. Now that has, number has dropped to 23%. On this side as well, 26% of members of parliament, in the first parliament, were, had, had prison terms, whereas nowadays, hardly anyone okay, has served in prison. Of course, because they, were, they are too young compared to, uh, to, you know, to have served substantial time in prison before, before the revolution. Same for cabinet members. Notice, for example, the numbers for the first two, 45 and 48 percent. And now you get to Mr. Rouhani as, as two, 3 percent or 2 percent for Mr. Ahmadinejad, et cetera. So again, a generational change is beginning to happen in terms of the background of this individual, whether in terms of age, prison experience, and, and the like. Okay. The next question I was interested in was that considering Iran has 31 provinces, what is the makeup? Where are these elites coming from? You know, what is the share of Tehran as the center of gravity 
in the country compared to the other provinces. And what do we find? Some fascinating stuff. These first five provinces, Tehran, uh, Esfahan, Fars, Khorasan, Razavi, and East Azerbaijan are much more important in terms of being the birthplace of the elite than any of the other provinces. When you get to this side, to the right side of the uh, chart, you will see some of the most underdeveloped provinces, and again, this is a terminology that the Iranian government uses, uh, some of the more underdeveloped provinces, such as Chahar, Mahal, Bakhtiyari, Kohkiliye, Buyer, Ahmad, Hormozgan, etc., have hardly produced members of the elite, which is, again, understandable. Please note that this is not normalized in terms of population. This is just the number of people who have been you know, born in each of these uh, provinces. I will come back to this in a, in a minute. Okay, here is one of the most disturbing findings from the research. Of course, women constitute 50% of the population, but what percentage of the elites of women? A mere 3.2%. A mere 3.2%. Of course, no woman has served in the Expediency Council, no one in the Guardian Council over the last 40 years. We have one individual who served in the assembly that approved the Constitution. Um, we have had one female minister who, by the way, President Ahmadinejad, appointed and then dismissed. And the rest of them mainly have been members of parliament, right? So where women have been able to get positions, it has been as members of, of parliament. And again, in my book, I go into detail about you know, who these individuals are, etc. But the other one is also quite interesting. If you look at the last line, 20% have been female vice presidents, and you would wonder why would women be, have such a high, high rate of vice presidents compared to their other numbers, right? The, the answer is very easy to understand. Whereas to become a minister, you need the approval of the supreme leader as well as the parliament. To become a vice president, you do not have to go through approval by the parliament. So it has become a convenient method of tokenism for presidents who want to show that they are doing something for women to appoint them as vice presidents, right? Vice president for environmental affairs, which I don't know what type of mandate you, you carry, right, in that, in that type of position. So it's quite disturbing that women constitute 50% of, you know, students at universities, et cetera, but 3.2% of the entire uh, elite. Okay, what about religious minorities? Again, the number is also quite disturbing, right? No Sunni Muslim has been appointed in Iran to any post of being a cabinet minister, a vice president, member of expediency council, or a guardian council so far. Where the Sunnis and other religious minorities have had a presence, of course, again, has been in the, in the parliament or in the uh, assembly of experts from provinces such as Sistan, Baluchistan, and Kurdistan, which have a sizable Sunni population, and therefore it, it's natural that those provinces will produce um, representatives who are, are, who are, who are Sunni. So, so here are, again, some hard data, right, which I think can back up our assertions about what is the status of women, what is the status of religious minorities in terms of being represented in, in Iranian politics. All right, next. Um, I was interested to find out what is happening in cabinet posts in terms of number of clerics and number of revolutionary guards. And notice what is happening here. Blue represents revolutionary guards and orange represents clergy, okay? You see that the revolutionary guards gradually have gone up and in the administrations of Mr. Ahmadinejad, okay, but also in, in that of you know, uh, President Rouhani, they have quite a, a significant presence. In other words, the revolutionary guards who during the course of the Iran-Iraq war were nothing but bodyguards to the clerics have now become their own men, right? They have emerged out of the shadow of the clerics and are knocking on the door and saying, I want a share of the power. And it gets represented in this type of numbers. Notice the clergy. This is, again, this is the a slide that I often refer to as the emperor is naked. 
percentage of clerics in the parliament after the revolution was over 50%, right? Now, it is 6%. A 44% drop in number of clerics, which begs the question, what's happening? Well, for one reason, people are not voting for clerics to become MPs. For another, clerics have decided they can do a better job in non-elected institutions of power rather than in elected institutions. So why do you want to throw your hat in the race and have the infamy of having lost an election, right? Where the supreme leader, or thanks to your other clerical collections, you can get a handsome position in, in a non-elected institution uh, in, in, in that race. But to put things in perspective, for those of you with an interest in history now, 6%. Clerical makeup of the parliament, this number is lower than the percentage in the, during the constitutional era, meaning 100 years ago. There were more clerics in Iran's parliament back then than it is now, 39 years after the establishment of a theocracy. Right? Quite revealing in terms of where the population is in terms of its voting behavior. Okay, so let's get to the question, uh, uh, the very first one. Who is right? The former MP who said 200 people rule, or John Limbert who said 25. Well, depends on how you count. Here is a frequency of times where these elites have held positions of power. Notice that if we you know, draw the mark here from 10 and above, OK, you get something in the neighborhood of 25 individuals who are the real heavyweights who have occupied 10 or more positions. And then look at over here, at the very top, right? Oops, I'm sorry. 1,340 individuals only appear once, meaning they get elected to parliament and then they are out. You circle out. So yes, the guys who are ruling Iran, and it's the guys, right? The guys who are ruling Iran are a small clique. No question about that. All right? I'm sure everybody is wondering who these people are. OK, so to satisfy your curiosity, here is the top list of the top offenders. OK, and again, household names. You see President Rouhani there. You see Mir Hossein Musavi, who, by the way, is sitting under house arrest on this list. You see Ali Larijani, a speaker of the parliament. Right now, right? Former uh, VPs like uh, Mr. Hassan Habibi, uh, who served in various uh, um, you know, cabinets, Mr. Hashemi Rafsanjani, and the like. Okay, so it's the usual suspects who have you know, held these positions of power in, in Iran. Okay, so I mentioned a moment ago that um, clerics are not getting elected to parliament. So please, if you were to think of Iranian political uh, structure as a pyramid, here is what I want to propose based on my research. And you can see the numbers to back that claim here. Change happens at the bottom of the political pyramid in Iran, meaning at the level of parliament where the people can kick out the rascals, right? The, the higher you go up in the pyramid, the less changes you see. So notice here, unelected, unelected institutions of power such as, for example, the Expediency Council, has an incumbency rate of 78%. Parliament, on the other hand, has what? 33%. Okay? Guardian Council, another unelected body, 73%. Whereas the elected body, Assembly of uh, Experts, 52%. Okay? So incumbency varies. And again, here is a visual of that. Okay? to see what, what happens. It's fascinating when you look at the continuities and discontinuities. For example, take a look here. Right? This is members of uh, cabinet. You wonder, what, what the hell is going on here? Well, the answer is this. When Ahmadinejad came to power, he said, I don't want anybody who had served in previous cabinets. Right? So that's why the incumbency rate drops so much. And of course, when Mr. Rouhani comes to power, he says, I don't want any of his guys 
Oops, okay. So he drops there, and that's why you see the fluctuations in terms of the incumbency rate. Okay, I mentioned the uh, provinces. Uh, and again, this is a subject that I'm really quite, quite interested in because I wanted to see whether the revolution really opened up channels for participation by people from the provinces, okay? And more importantly, does the change come, does it you know, depend on whether you come from provincial capitals or not? So here on the first part, you see that again, those top provinces are well represented in terms of producing members of the assembly of experts. And on the right hand side, you see how many of them come from provincial capitals. So the percentage varies. So Mashhad, for example, right? You have to be part of the, the seminary in Mashhad to be able to have your you know, credentials stamped to get positions of, of power. But you know, in some of the other ones, like Isfahan, that's not necessarily the case. Or if you go on this one again, for cabinet members, you see Tehran still accounts for a good percentage, 27% there, followed by Isfahan. Isfahan is the second most important province in Iran after Tehran in terms of producing elites. Okay? When it comes to clerical members, Isfahan even outperforms Tehran in terms of producing elites. So it's very important to look at this thing for those of us interested in the politics of ethnicity in Iran. Right? For example, how are the Azerbaijanis? represented in Iranian politics. Now you have you know, hard numbers on what's happening, for example, with East Azerbaijan, West Azerbaijan, et cetera, et cetera. But if I, but if I give you the numbers, as you can see here, right, for those deprived provinces, notice, for example, Boucher, Ilam, Coquillier, zero, right, zero, okay? So in short, I, I've run out of time, so I will, I will stop here. Uh, but I would be happy to um, ascertain questions later on about other aspects of this study. Thank you. Thank you.